Hello, friends. Nice to see you again for our next to last chemistry review session. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. Today will be the last day that we actually cover content. Um, and that content will be uh, transformations and energy. So uh, let's dive in. Just a quick reminder of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, we talked about a lot of stuff. Uh, last time we did not quite finish uh, all the kinetics and thermodynamics we wanted to talk about. So we'll, we'll finish that today. Uh, and we're also going to lean in a little bit to energy and calorimetry and all those sorts of, of uh, fun stuff. Um, I do want to mention, though, uh, that, that we will be having one final review session next week. Uh, and in, in it, I'm going to be looking into my crystal ball to the extent that I can to try to kind of predict what kind of problems I think they might test this year. Uh, that being said, I know there are some of you out there, because uh, I can see your sign in names, uh, who've been to a couple of these things. So uh, uh, one, thanks. Uh, it's been fun. And two, uh, you know, if you guys have particular questions that you want to see addressed, um, just shoot me an email, right? Uh, I'm Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at prepmatters.com. Uh, let me know you've been here. Let me know what you think. Uh, this is the first time I've done one of these things, so I, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and, you know, just uh, send along whatever things you might think uh, you're weak on, whatever problems you want to see featured next week, because uh, I'll be kind of putting, uh, putting my, my head to the, the, the task of, of what kind of problems to create all week. So uh, if you get me some feedback, there's a good chance that I can include uh, the particular things that you'd like to see. So um, without further ado, let's dive in. So last week's question was all about change, how fast and how far. Last week, we started talking a lot about how fast, that is the kinetics of a reaction. How fast does A and B turn into C? Um, this week, we're going to turn our attention uh, in a few slides uh, to the thermodynamics of the situation. That is not so much how fast do A and B turn into C, but how much of A and B turn into C uh, by the time one reaches equilibrium. So, uh, but before I can deal with that, I wanna talk a little bit about some energy concepts that we're gonna find useful in our discussion of equilibrium. So without further ado, let's consider a chemical reaction uh, and let's consider an elementary reaction. And those of you uh, who, who were on the line should remember that that's a what you see is what you get kind of chemical reaction uh, where um, uh, the reaction occurs just as it looks like. Uh, and we looked at that thing in terms of an energy diagram, which I'm going to fill out here, uh, where we have energy on the y-axis and on the x-axis something vague called re reaction coordinate, which really means going from reactants on the left to products on the right. Here we're going to pass through that what's called activated complex or sometimes called the transition state. In this case our reactants N2O2 and Cl2 uh, form our products, two NOCLs, and, and they probably, you know, smash together in this kind of way uh, in, in that activated complex. And we did talk about an activation energy because we know that the higher the activation energy, right, uh, the slower the reaction will be. Or uh, conversely, the, the higher the temperature, uh, the more fractional molecules will be able to get over that activation energy. Um, today, let's add in something else. And let's add in the, the heat of reaction, right? Um, so this is the difference between the reactants and the products. Here we can see that the reactants have more energy than do the products. So that means that, that we can give this type of reaction a name. We can actually call it an exothermic reaction. So um, what does that mean and, and why does that happen? Well, first of all, what it means is if we think about uh, kind of thermodynamics, it talks a lot about the system and the surroundings. In this case, the system is simply all of the atoms involved in this chemical reaction and the surroundings is basically the rest of the universe. So here uh, we can see that since the reactants have more energy than the products, that energy has to go somewhere. So that means that energy in when this reaction occurs, will be released from the system to the surroundings, right? So if we want to think about why that is, uh, let's take a look at that transition state. 
right? Because the transition state is the guy that's halfway in the middle where some bonds are beginning to be broken. Uh, for example, looks like uh, those two chlorine bonds and uh, those two uh, uh, nitrogen atoms are, are breaking apart. Um, and some bonds are being formed, right? As those bonds are being broken, uh, these other bonds uh, between the uh, chlorines and the um, and the oxygens are being formed. Uh, well, in this case, since it's an exothermic reaction, um, we know that bonds to break bonds cost energy, but when bonds are formed, I get energy back, right? And in this case, since it's exothermic, right, the bonds broken must have uh, required less energy to break than the energy that, I re that was released when those bonds were formed. So net gain in energy, net release in energy to the system and we can, or from the system to the surroundings. And, and we can think of that in terms of, of those bonds being broken and bonds formed. So that's what looks true for an exothermic reaction, uh, you know, often called kind of downhill reaction. Uh, of course, we can think of the opposite, right? Um, let's consider this different reaction where nitrogen and oxygen form nitrous oxide. Um, and as you, as you might expect, we're gonna look at an energy diagram and this one's going to be uphill, right? Um, now our products are going to have a greater energy uh, than our reactions than our reactants do. And of course, the activated complex here has higher energy than both of them, right? Um, so now we can look at our reactants and products and, and think about the same idea. Now, since the products uh, require more energy than the reactants, that energy had to come somewhere. In this case, my delta H is, is going to be positive greater than zero. Um, and we're gonna call this an endothermic reaction, right? For this endothermic reaction, heat's going to be absorbed from the surroundings into the system in order for this reaction to take place, right? So you need energy to drive an endothermic reaction in the way that you just don't for an exothermic reaction. And again, we can look at, at kind of the bonds broken and formed here. Um, in this case, the, the, it took more energy to break those bonds than we got back from forming the new bonds. So, so that's, a, that's kind of a net, um, a net loss of energy and that has to come from somewhere. And that's why uh, an endothermic reaction is going to absorb energy from its surroundings surroundings in order to occur, right? Um, so we're talking about heat. We're talking about heat. W what the heck is heat actually? Um, well, heat really is it's just energy, right? Going from one place to another. Uh, they both have units of joules, uh, same thing. So when you think about how heat transfer works back in, oh, I don't know, maybe eighth grade science, uh, you learned about three modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about kind of molecularly how that works and in particular uh, really just going to talk about conduction today because um, that, that's the one that we, we probably need to know a little more about in terms of, of understanding the concepts we need for the AP. Um, convection, all right, warm air rises, the currents and circulation gets a little complicated and radiation, um, yeah, is not something we're going to worry about today. That's, you know, how the sun warms the earth, let's say, energy from light. Um, so let's imagine we have a box. Um, in that box, we've got some uh, hot gas particles. Uh, clearly they're hot because I have labeled them red. Um, and they're all moving around pretty darn fast. And we can see those long arrows saying that these guys are moving fast. And let's imagine also in our box, we have a colder gas. Uh, clearly colder because blue, uh, that's moving more slowly, uh, as I've tried to indicate using these kind of shorter arrows. Um, so. Uh, if I, I put a hot and a cold gas in a box together at some point, um, well, the hot atoms are going to get cooler and the cool atoms are going to get warmer and eventually everybody's going to be at the same temperature. So how does that happen? So let's kind of look at, at highlight kind of one collision there and let's draw our attention to those guys that are on a collision course and think about what happens. Um, because temperature really is just average speed right? Uh, and the red guy here is moving faster than the blue guy and they're going to collide. And what's going to happen though is the red guy after it collides is going to be moving more slowly than it was before. And the slow one is now going to be moving faster than it was before, right? And that's just kind of the physics of how, how these collisions work, right? So now each of these molecules, one of them was moving real fast and real slow. After the collision, they're both a little closer to the same speed, right? And you can imagine how these collisions happen over and over and over again um, in, in, in a substance. And that's actually how these guys achieve the same temperature. 
right? Um, and I know that we talked before about this thing called the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. So clearly the picture I've drawn here is a little simplified, right? It is clearly not the case that all the hot particles are moving at the same speed and all the cold particles are moving at the same speed. Um, I just wanted to make my life a little easier in the, in the picture drawing. Um, so really when you think about what's gonna happen, it, it's kind of like um, that cold molecule distribution and that hot molecule distribution are going to kind of merge to form one overall distribution of molecular speeds or molecular energies um, that corresponds to some temperature in between, right? And once that's happened, that's what we call thermal equilibrium, right? There are still collisions, energy still being transferred, um, but there's no necessarily net gain or loss from one gas to the other because they basically have the same distribution of speeds, right? And this is how we end up at one final temperature um, that's somewhere between that cold and hot temperature. Um, you know, and temperature can be a funny thing, right? Um, uh, it was a, it was actually a, a beautiful day this weekend. Uh, so, so the kids and I were were out were out playing uh, with some water guns, and of course they got cold. Um, so it's interesting, right? Because like seventy degrees. If I said seventy degrees, it was like a seventy degree day. That's great. Everybody was out wearing shorts. But if I asked you to spend all day in seventy degree water, I don't think you'd be nearly as happy, right? Seventy degree water just kind of feels colder than 70 degree air. Um, and this is exactly why. When you think about it, how is it that 70 degree water or air makes you cooler? Well, all of the molecules in the water or air colliding with you um, and taking a little bit of your energy away every time. Well, water is just a whole lot more dense than air is. There's a lot more collisions between the water molecules and you than between the air molecules and you, right? Which is why, again, 65 degree day, let's push it, it's still nice, right? You're wearing a t-shirt, 65 degree water, you're kind of wearing a wetsuit, right? Um, water is just much better at, at removing that energy. Uh, than, than air is. And then of course we also have what's called evaporative cooling, uh, but I don't want to steal my own thunder because we're going to be getting to that in just a slide or two or three. So, um, so yeah, so, so heat is being transferred and that's going to change temperatures because temperature is just a measure of internal energy. So as the energy goes up or down, so does the temperature. But of course, it's not completely that simple. Because um, if I can imagine, um, uh, thinking about the uh, change in temperature that uh, a material experiences when I add or remove heat to it. Um, let's think about water, right? If clearly if I, if water absorbs heat, and by the way, Q is always heat. Um, I'm not actually sure why that is, um, but it is. Um, <clears throat> so clearly as the, as the water absorbs uh, that heat, its temperature goes up. But if you can imagine, I don't know, putting that water in a copper pot and cooking with it, well, um, actually the copper absorbs heat as well, but uh, interestingly, the copper gets hotter a lot faster than the water does, right? Water is actually incredibly difficult to heat, right? I mean, we have sayings about this, right? A watched pot never boils. It's hard to heat and boil water. Um, metal, however, like copper, really easy to heat. Um, so, so what's going on with that? Well, it, it actually has to do with the molecular structure a little bit, um, because we know that heat is average kinetic energy. And in order for something to get hotter, we need to kind of set those molecules in motion a little bit. So how hard is that or how easy is that to do? Well, in copper, it turns out that it's really easy for that to happen, right? Um, because if you remember in our metallic bonding model, we have some nuclei surrounded by a sea of electrons and those nuclei aren't really totally tied down to anything. Uh, sure, they're vaguely occupying their lattice positions, but they're free to vibrate pretty easily. And uh, actually, it's really easy for their vibration to set their neighbors to vibrating because they're all exactly the same distance apart. Well, exactly, more or less. Um, on the other hand, if you think about water, um, water is, is tied together in this kind of loose network of hydrogen bonds. So in order to make water hotter, you're going to have to cause those water molecules to vibrate. Maybe they'll vibrate, maybe they'll rotate. Well, they really don't want to rotate because if they rotate, they're going to break all their hydrogen bonds, right? So all of those hydrogen bonds that tie those water molecules together in that very particular arrangement, 
right? Um, that just makes it that much harder um, to, to make them move faster, that much harder to, to, to change the temperature. So it just takes more energy or more heat to do that, right? The number that we use to describe that is what's called the specific heat capacity, which very simply is the amount of heat required um, to, to increase, uh, let's say one gram of, uh, of a substance by one degree Celsius, right? And that's the unit that's called the joule. Right. So you'll probably be used to seeing that equation, right? Q equals MC delta T, the mass of the substance times the specific heat times the temperature change equals the amount of heat. Um, and if in fact you, uh, you know, consult a, a quality reference textbook or go online, you'll find that the specific heat of copper is way, way less than the specific heat of, of water, more than 10 times different. Right, um, and, and you know another way to think of specific heat capacity because it's got this word capacity in it. Right, um, you can think of like um, imagine a, a piece of, of copper uh, at 100 degrees and some water at 100 degrees. Right, well the water kind of at 100 degrees is holding more heat, if you will. It represents a larger investment of heat energy to get to that temperature, which is kind of why we use this word heat capacity. Right. Um, so, so what's going to happen if I take, I don't know, a hot chunk of copper and, and dip it in some water? Well, clearly, uh, heat is going to be transferred from the hot chunk of copper uh, to the water. Uh, and the first law of thermodynamics says that energy is conserved. So uh, when we do these calculations, we're going to assume that the amount of heat gained by the water is exactly equal to the amount of of, or the amount of energy, pardon me, gained by the water uh, is the amount of energy lost by the copper, right? So uh, in, in the form of heat. Uh, what isn't the case though, is that it's not the case that the temperature changes by the same amount, right? Um, you would imagine probably that the copper is going to change its temperature way more easily than does the water. Right, so um, expect to, to see calculations like that. Um, but I wanna add one more wrinkle into it before we get to those calculations. And that would be what's, what's called phase changes in the heating curve. Um, by the way, uh, the AP has decided that uh, phase diagrams, right? Those things that showed the, where's the solid, where's the liquid, where's the vapor, temperature pressure axes. Yep, not on the test. So uh, if you're sweating those, don't worry about it. They're, they're really not covered on the AP. Um, the, the graph I do wanna talk about that, that I, I do think it's helpful to understand. It's called the heating curve, right? So here, if I kind of imagine, um, I don't know, taking a chunk of ice, uh, putting it in a pot and putting it on the stove, right? And we're going to cover the pot and then we're going to, I don't know, put a, put a thermometer in the ice with apparently a thermometer sized hole in the lid. Um, you know, and we're going to turn on the heat and we're going to watch what happens, right? As you might imagine, that temperature of the ice increases. Right? As I add more heat to the ice, well, it gets warmer. And that's true until it hits zero degrees. And then something interesting happens. Right? As you continue to add heat, the temperature doesn't change. Right? What's happening here clearly is that the ice and water are, or the ice is melting and forming water. Right? During that melting process, during that phase transition from a solid to a liquid, uh, there is no temperature change. Only when the last bit of ice melts and you have 100% uh, water, uh, only then, uh, as you continue to add heat, does the water get warmer and warmer and warmer. And then, of course, this same story is repeated at 100 degrees when water begins to boil, right? And that boiling water stays at 100 degrees until every bit of it is turned into steam. And only then, after it's all vaporized, can that steam get warmer, right? So that is what we call the heating and cooling curve of water. Um, so when we think about those kind of, uh, those, those, uh, times when the temperature isn't changing, right? Kind of how much energy that represents um, is what's actually called the latent heat of fusion in the case of the melting process. And, you know, when you think of the melting process, um, that's pretty much opposite the freezing process, right? So fusion uh, kind of has more to do with freezing, but, you know, same, same number, right? Amount of heat required to melt is the amount of heat gained back by freezing. Um, you know, and the same thing is true for uh, vaporization and condensation. Um, you know, what you may notice here, and I haven't drawn this figure perfectly to scale, uh, but I, I have tried to capture one really important thing, and that is uh, that the heat of fusion uh, is, is less than the heat of vaporization, right? Um, in this case, uh, you know, again, figure not drawn to scale here, it only looks like three times, it's probably closer to seven. Um, so why is that? Well, let's kind of think about what happens during those different 
regimes, right? If you were doing a calculation, right, uh, the, the kind of the slopey bits here, you would be thinking the amount of heat uh, and you'd be using the heat capacity, which has to do with the slope of that line, right? How much heat do I have to add to change temperature? Because all of the energy you're adding to the system at that point is going, uh, is becoming kinetic energy of the molecules, right? It's, it's causing those molecules and, and atoms to move faster and faster and faster, thus increasing the temperature. But let's think about the horizontal lines. Where's the energy going now, right? Um, I'm adding energy to the system, uh, and although apparently it's not increasing the kinetic energy of the molecules, um, what it's doing is it's increasing the potential energy of the molecules. That energy is going into, because if we think about the difference between a solid, a liquid, and a gas, right? We, we talked about that, um, I think it was two weeks ago when we talked about states of matter. Um, it's all to do with the intermolecular forces, right? So um, all of that energy that, that, that it takes to melt ice or, or even more energy that it takes to boil water all uh, involves overcoming those intermolecular forces, in this case, breaking hydrogen bonds, right? Um, and we also talked about the fact that ice, or solid, sorry, solids and liquids, are, are what we call condensed phases. They're pretty similar, right? There's a, a lot of hydrogen bonding in water. There's even more in ice. So to get from ice to water, I just had to break a couple of hydrogen bonds. To get from water to steam, however, pretty much had to break them all. Right, so that's why the heat of vaporization is always greater than the heat of fusion, right? So let's put some of this stuff in service of a calculation. So let's go back to our copper chunk in our water. Um, and let's imagine we have a, um, oh, apparently it's not copper, it's an unknown metal. Um, and it's really hot, it's uh, 1,050 degrees and 520 gram sample is placed right on top of a 500 gram chunk of ice at zero degrees. Um, and apparently uh, it's hot enough that it melts that ice and I'm left with uh, my block of unknown metal in a puddle of water um, and everything's at 20 degrees. Okay, great. So what they want is to find the heat capacity of that unknown metal. And if we do that, we could probably make a pretty good guess as to what that metal is, again, by you know, letting your fingers do the Googling. So how would we do this? Um, so we're gonna assume uh, conservation of energy holds and that the heat lost by the metal equals the heat gained by the water, right? Um, so uh, if we think about what that heat is doing, right? That heat is just cooling the metal. Uh, that losing the heat is cooling the metal. But gaining the heat is doing two things. It's melting the ice and it's heating the water that results. So if I kind of imagine what my equation looks like, the cooling the metal part is just MC delta T, there are no phase changes. But to melt the ice uh, and to heat the water, that's actually two kind of different calculations, right? Um, so I need to use that latent heat of fusion, which by the way, I'll just warn you that the latent heat of fusion is almost always in like kilojoules per mole, where the heat capacity is in joules per gram. So there's some unit conversion things going on here. Uh, you'll just want to be sharp about that when you're doing the calculations yourself. Um, so we have 525 grams uh, with an unknown heat capacity. And then the temperature change uh, that that metal experienced, right, was, was the, the final minus um, uh, or initial minus final in this case, since it's cooling. Uh, 1,050 minus 20. So that must be equal to uh, the amount of heat it took to melt the ice. So we first do a fast conversion of, uh, of, uh, of uh, pardon me, uh, grams to moles. And we have 500 grams of water, uh, ice, but whatever, uh, 18 grams per mole. So that's the number of moles times that heat of fusion, which I've here converted already to joules add that to the MC delta T part that results from heating that now zero degree water up to 20 degrees. And we got some big numbers, right? 684,000 times our heat capacity, something like 208,000. And if we do a quick division, we'll find that that uh, heat capacity with sig figs here, which there aren't very many of, is around 0.3 joules per gram mole. Um, uh, if you recall from the last page, gosh, that's real, real close to copper. So uh, yeah, unknown metal. I'm not being very clever, am I? Um, clearly it's copper again. But I wanted to illustrate how you want, would kind of uh, break uh, these heating and cooling calculations into different parts if we've got some phase changes going on, right? So uh, moving on to, to uh, how, how we're gonna use this heat in a little more kind of chemistry application. Um, let's talk about what a thermochemical equation is. 
sounds like a chemical equation, but it added some thermo. Well, that's exactly what it is, right? Here's a chemical equation, uh, four iron plus three oxygen goes to two Fe2O3. Um, what makes it a thermochemical equation is I've just included the delta H. So was this an exothermic or an endothermic reaction? Delta H is negative, products minus reactants is negative. That must mean reactants have more energy and the products have less, that energy needs to go somewhere. So this is an exothermic reaction, right? When this reaction occurs, heat is evolved and released to the environment. Um, well, how do we know that? How do we, how do we calculate it? Um, as you might recall from how I answer that question pretty much every time, well, um, you do some experiments, right? But we can, um, we can do some approximations. Right? We can estimate it using a variety of techniques. Um, and there are three that, that you'll want to be conversant in because these are the types of problems that might come up. Well, the first called Hess's Law, uh, the second using heats of formation, and the third using what are called bond enthalpies. Um, and a note, actually. Uh, I, I, you, know, you, you see this word enthalpy thrown around a lot. And I know you've seen the word energy, and, and I'm going to use those almost interchangeably, which is kind of a bad habit for which I apologize. Um, but, but honestly, like the, the subtle differences between enthalpy and energy kind of kind of not on the AP a little bit. If you, if you go on to, to study chemistry in college or physics in college, you'll learn the subtle differences here. Um, enthalpy really um, has to do with the amount of energy uh, absorbed or released as heat during a constant pressure reaction. Um, again, the details right now are unimportant. For now, when someone says enthalpy or energy, just kind of visualize them in the same way. Think of them as the same y-axis, um, and it's not going to cause any problems for you right now. So let's dive into those three methods. The first is Hess's law, uh, where, which basically is, is really saying that enthalpy, or energy for that matter, is what's called the state function, right? fancy sounding language, a state function, really all that means is uh, the change in enthalpy or change in energy between two states simply depends on the starting point and the ending point. It doesn't matter how I get there, right? So if I imagine some A uh, goes to B and I put it here on some kind of energy landscape where again, uh, A is the, the reactants and B is the products. Here I haven't drawn the curvy line, but just kind of getting from A to B. Um, you know, there might be a couple ways to get from A to B. Uh, I might go through this intermediate C that's really high energy. Um, but if the energy goes up, well, then it has to go down. Or I might go through this different intermediate D, which has low energy, but then I'm going to need to do a steep climb to get up to B. So it really doesn't matter what path I take. The difference in energy is the difference in energy, right? So that's basically the, the point behind Hess's law. How do we use it? Well, it'll end up being a problem that looks a lot like this. Well, I'll say, OK. Let's use the following data to calculate the enthalpy of reaction or heat of reaction um, for the combustion of methane. Uh, and they give us a couple equations here, a couple thermochemical equations that have delta H's attached to them. So um, how are we going to do this? Well, first, we need an equation for the combustion of methane. Uh, well, uh, you should know by now that to combust, I add oxygen, and the products are CO2 and water. Um, it would help if that thing were balanced. So let's uh, balance carbon, it is already balanced. Let's balance oxygen, throw a two there. Um, let's balance uh, hydrogen, throw a two there. Oxygen, throw a two there. And now, now we're all good. Um, wonderful. So uh, now the Hess's Law game is to assemble that reaction from the little jigsaw puzzle pieces of reactions that we have. Right. So um, uh, I'm looking at our balanced chemical reaction. And the first component there is the first molecule is methane. Well, where do I see methane in, our, uh, in the reactions we have? Well, it's in that first reaction. But it's kind of on the wrong side, right? So I'm going to need to reverse that reaction. And if I reverse the reaction, I change the sign of delta H, right? So I'm going to write that first reaction in reverse, and I'm going to change that sign of delta H from negative 74.8 joules exothermic to positive 74.8 joules endothermic. And that should make sense, because if the reaction happens one way and it absorbs heat, well, then when it happens the other way, it should probably release heat. Um, OK, so now I have methane where I want it. Um, but I introduced some carbon. Gosh, I don't want carbon in my reaction, so I'm going to want that to cancel out. Uh, oh, look, the second reaction has some carbon in it. I'm going to want to keep that one just the way it is so that those carbons are going to cancel for me. Uh, so I'm just going to copy that one down in the delta H as it stands. Um, finally, uh, you might say to yourself, OK, well, I need some water on the product side, and I don't see that in either of my equations yet, so I'm going to need the last one. Well, but I need two water molecules in my balanced equation. So what we're going to do is we're just going to double everything. We're going to multiply that reaction by two. And when we do that, 
we actually double the delta H. Great. Um, so if I add all of those together, you'll see that uh, all of those hydrogens cancel and all of the carbons cancel. And my net uh, equation is exactly the equation I'm looking for. And I get a delta H of negative 880.3 kilojoules, which should make sense. Is that endothermic or exothermic? Negative delta H, really exothermic here, um, as combustion reactions tend to be, right? Um, I mean, this is methane, it's natural gas. This is how I suspect about half of you heat your home right now by burning this stuff. So it makes sense that we have a really exothermic reaction, right? So uh, that's Hess's law, but we need the exact right set of equations to make that work, right? Which we don't always have. So enter a new technique that's a little more flexible called using heats of formation. So the heat of formation technically is a heat of reaction for a very specific reaction, for the, for the reaction that creates a molecule from the elements in its standard state, right? And then really we've basically reduced Hess's law to a big formula because I, if I add all of those reactions for all of the reactants and products in the right way, all of the elements in the standard states will cancel and I'll just be left with the right reaction. So Hess's law is a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle. You've got to kind of be thinking and figuring it out. Heats of formation, a little easier. Less thinking, more formulaic, right? All I need to do is uh, find the heats of formation for all my products um, and subtract the heats of formation for all my reactants. Well, where do I get those heats of formations? I look them up in a table. Um, this one I, uh, I liberated from uh, the good folks at NIST, National uh, Institute of Standards and Technology here in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, all right, so let's do a problem. Uh, same problem, in fact, um, but let's use the heat of formation data to calculate that enthalpy change, right? Um, so we have the same balanced equation. So now we just need to look up the heats of formation. Um, I can do that and find the heat of formation of methane, uh, 74.8 for water, uh, for carbon dioxide. And now with that list, it's pretty simple arithmetic, right? Um, it's going to be the heat of formation of um, uh, carbon dioxide, because it's again, products minus reactants, um, plus two of the heats of formation of water, uh, two, because uh, there are two of them, uh, minus the heat of formation of methane. Uh, and that's it. Wait, is that it? Have I forgotten oxygen? Well, no, because oxygen is already in its standard elemental state. Anything that's a pure element in its standard state doesn't have a heat of formation because it's already made. Right? So if I subtract those, I get negative 80.3, which by the way is exactly what I got from my last calculation. Uh, those of you with sharp eyes might have noticed that all the numbers were the same. Why? Well, actually, if you look at the reactions I gave you, those really are heats of formation right there, right? Because you know that first reaction is making methane from its standard states, by the way. This isn't how methane's actually made, right? You don't like find a, a, a pile of carbon and mix it together with hydrogen and stir it and make methane. Um, so these reactions are, are often kind of kind of dumb, really. They don't make a lot of sense, but um, the energy balance is out, right? And that's really all we care about, right? So um, great. So heats of formation uh, gets exactly the same number. Let's look at the, the third trick, bond enthalpy. So we said we liked heats of formation because it was just a little easier to use. I didn't need the right puzzle pieces that I needed for Hess's law. Um, but I mean, there are lots of chemicals out there. Looking up heats of formation for all of them can be kind of a pain. Um, so bond enthalpy takes that idea one step further, right? Um, where a bond enthalpy is, we talked again earlier today about uh, how it takes energy to break bonds and how much I get energy back when I form bonds. Well, if I just think about how much energy does it take to break a particular bond or how much energy do I get back, I can do that calculation that I kind of walked through on the endothermic exothermic reaction landscape. So we can just do the math, right? But in order to do the math, we're going to need some numbers. And here it's great. So instead of looking at pages and pages and pages of thermochemical data to find your heats of formation, it's now on honestly like a, you know, um, uh, what, do, what do I want to say, a postcard sized chart that just tells us everything we need. Uh, here uh, for our, I've just included a selection of the chart, you know, you'd probably want to include other elements if you were being uh, uh, really completist here, uh, but this is enough to get the job done for us. So we can see that um, a hydrogen-hydrogen bond uh, has a bond enthalpy of 436 kilojoules per mole, uh, hydrogen-nitrogen 413, and so on and so on. Uh, those are all single bonds, the double and triple bonds are below, 
So let's again do our problem. So now when we do this problem using bond enthalpies, we're gonna to need to think of a little more chemically about actually what's going on, right? So that methane, I'm going to actually write uh, the structure of it so I can see what kind of bonds we've got, right? I've got four carbon hydrogen bonds. Uh, and then we have two oxygens and each one of those is gonna have a double bond. Uh, and that's gonna produce uh, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, two double bonds there between carbon and oxygen, and finally two water molecules. So now I just really need to uh, follow the formula, right? So uh, sum of bonds broken minus bonds formed. By the way, this one's a little weird. Be careful here, right? Deltas in chemistry are almost always products minus reactants, products minus reactants. This is like the only exception I can think of where you're actually starting with the reactant side and not the product side. Um, you might be wondering, gosh, that's a weird exception. Why is that? Um, well, again, because really it's about the sign convention. That's all it is, right? Because breaking bonds requires energy, but forming bonds uh, gets energy back, right? So technically all those bond enthalpies, the energy of a bond, they should all kind of be negative, right? But it would just be annoying to put like negative signs in the entire table. So people just by convention don't and remember to kind of do this in the opposite way. Um, so if we do the math and grab all those numbers from the tables, uh, four carbon hydrogens, two oxygen oxygens, uh, two carbon oxygens, and a total of four hydrogen oxygens, we'll get a number of negative 802 kilojoules, which is reasonably close to what we got with Hess's law or heats of formation. Um, but which do you think is more accurate? Well, uh, if you said Hess's law and heats of formation, you would be correct. Why? Because these bond enthalpies, they're kind of average, right? Yeah, uh, a carbon-hydrogen bond is a carbon-hydrogen bond, but what else is that carbon bonded to, right? What else is that oxygen bonded to? The, the kind of greater environment that the, the bond finds itself in kind of can affect the bond energy. So these are really only averages. So, so it's nice that, again, we can do all of this with information contained on a postcard, but the price we pay is it's a little less accurate. But uh, for a quick and dirty calculation, it gives us a pretty darn good estimation. Right? So uh, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about with energy. And let's kind of put that now in service of, of the idea of equilibrium and go from there. So equilibrium requires a reversible process, right? Um, if the process doesn't go from A to B and B back to A, if it's just one way street, you're never going to find an equilibrium. So we've talked a lot, actually, whether you've known it or not, about some reversible processes already, right? Phase changes are reversible processes going from, um, you know, boiling water. Right? On one hand, if I boil the water, um, that's um, going to require energy uh, to break those intermolecular forces, but then water can recondense, right? um, which is an exothermic process, and, and those intermolecular forces form right back, totally reversible. Right? Acid-base reactions, which I know are not like totally on the test in all their glory, but you should be comfortable enough with them to recognize them when they come up. Right? Uh, that's just a, a proton jumping uh, from my acid to my base or the reverse reaction uh, from the conjugate acid back to the conjugate base. So that's another reversible reaction. And then our redox reactions were also reversible. Um, this one I've included is uh, from a NICAD battery, uh, a nickel cadmium battery, which uh, you know, the little uh, rechargeable batteries that kind of look like double A's, but you can actually like put them in a device and recharge them. Yeah, this is actually the reaction they use, um, you know, and when, uh, when the uh, reaction goes one way and it discharges, uh, you know, nickel's gaining electrons uh, and cadmium's losing them, but when I charge it, it just goes back the other way. And then who, he who has lost gained and he who has gained lost because that's the way of the world. So lots of these reversible processes, right? And those result in equilibrium, right? And the, the chart we showed last week uh, involved uh, this reaction for the production of ammonia called the Haber process. Um, and we said that equilibrium was that point you got where the concentrations just stop changing, right? And it's not the case that reactions stopped. It's just the concentrations aren't changing anymore. The reactions keep going, right? Because if I think about kind of um, separating this reaction into a forward reaction and a reverse reaction, well, the forward reaction, um, nitrogen and hydrogen, get me ammonia, has some sort of rate constant. And we talked about what that rate law might look like last week, where the rate's proportional to the amount of nitrogen and the amount of hydrogen to some stoichiometric coefficients, right? Um, and what's going to happen to that rate? Well, it's going to decrease, right? Why is that? Simply because I start with a lot of nitrogen and hydrogen, but as the nitrogen and hydrogen gets used up, well, then the rate slows down because there's less to react, 
Similarly, if I look at the reverse reaction, ammonia spontaneously decomposing into nitrogen and hydrogen, well, initially the rate is zero because I don't have any ammonia. Um, but as I make ammonia, well, then that rate can kick in. I now have a concentration of ammonia. That reaction can happen and that rate's going to increase as the amount of ammonia increases. So that's another way to think about what that equilibrium is. It's where the rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the reverse reaction are the same. So the reactions are happening, they're just happening at the exact same speed, right? And this is just the, the leaky robot analogy that I'm, I suspect your teacher talked about, right? Um, you're in a rowboat, it's leaking, but you're bailing out the water, right? If you bail out the water at the same rate that it leaks, the water level doesn't change. It's not the same water, but the water level seems constant, right? Um, and that's exactly what's going on in these dynamic equilibriums, right? The reactions don't stop, forward and reverse are just going at the same speed, right? So how do we know where, those, where, where that equilibrium is? Well, we use something called an equilibrium constant, right? A number that relates the amount of reactants to the amount of products at equilibrium, where those rates are the same, right? And for the token skeleton reaction, AAs plus BBs goes to CCs plus DDs, right? Our equilibrium constant, or KEQ, uh, looks like the products to their stoichiometric coefficients over the reactants to their stoichiometric coefficients. Right. Um, very important to note here, um, only aqueous guys participate. Solids and liquids, not going to play in our KEQ expressions. Right. Also, uh, for those of you who did this in school, um, there's KC, where, which is kind of the K I'm showing, which is based on concentration units, and KP, uh, which is often used for gaseous phase reactions that have to do with partial pressures. Um, yeah, going back and forth between KP and KC, which you need the ideal gas law for, it's not that hard. It's just not on the AP, so don't lose a lot of sleep preparing for that. Um, so I want to give you one other way to think about kind of KEQ as well. And again, we're going to think about decomposing this reaction into a forward reaction and a reverse reaction. And we said that uh, equilibrium is where the rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the reverse reaction um, are equal, right? Where I'm now just saying that some KF is going to be the rate constant of my forward reaction and KR is the rate constant of my reverse reaction, F and R. Um, well, if I set those equal to each other and just kind of solve, <clears throat> uh, you can kind of see where that uh, expression comes from. Uh, pardon me. <coughs> hmm. So another way to think about the equilibrium constant is it's simply the forward rate constant divided by the, the reverse rate constant. And that kind of links uh, this big K equilibrium constant to the rate constants that we talked about a lot last time. So back to our friendly picture. Um, what do you think is true about the equilibrium constant for this reaction? Is it a large number? Is it a small number? Um, well, let's think about what that would mean, right? If the equilibrium constant is really, really small, much less than one, well, the equilibrium constant is the ratio of products to reactants, right? If it's much less than one, uh, then you would expect to find uh, something that looks like this, where I've drawn like maybe one lonesome ammonia molecule here in a sea of nitrogen and hydrogen. Why? Because basically the reaction hasn't happened. Right, very few products, lots of reactants. If K is around one, 10.1, somewhere thereabouts, you're gonna have a pretty decent, pretty decent mix of reactants and products. Um, and if K is much, much greater than one, um, you would find that pretty much all of this is ammonia with a very, very little nitrogen or hydrogen left. Well, if I just look at the uh, picture I have, yeah, I mean, hydrogen and ammonia concentrations here are about the same. So you would imagine that the KEQ for this reaction um, is somewhat around one. Um, and in fact, uh, it, of course, it depends on temperature, right? KEQ very sensitive to temperature, but yeah, you might look it up at 500 degrees. I think that 500 Kelvin, I think it's like 0.218 or something like that, if I'm recalling correctly, but it's around one, right? So I just want you to be able to look at a KEQ and visualize in your head what that particulate model might look like at the end of the day, right? Because I know that the, the test just loves their particulate models. Um, so I want you to be ready for that. So let's do an equilibrium calculation, which of course uses everybody's favorite favorite uh, tool called the ice table. So if 1.5 moles of nitrogen and oxygen are placed in a five liter vessel and allowed to react, um, find the concentration of nitrous oxide at equilibrium. So uh, here I have shown the reaction, nitrogen and oxygen, 2NO, um, and a KEQ that here is pretty small. 
right? So uh, would we expect uh, this to alternate into NO? Nope, we wouldn't. Small KEQ, probably gonna be a lot of N2, NO2 left at the end of the day, probably not much nitrous oxide. And it's useful to just have that kind of expectation so that you can check at the end and make sure you didn't do anything silly with the math. Um, all right, well, let's do this. Um, so, okay, in order to do this, we need some initial concentrations, and we put 1.5 moles into a five liter vessel, so that's just simply uh, moles per volume is molarity, so each of my initial reactants is at 0.3, and I'm assuming, since they didn't tell me anything, that there's no nitrous to begin. So we set up our ice table, right? And ice, of course, is short for initial change and equilibrium. Right, the initial concentrations of N2 and O2 are 0.3, and there's no nitrous oxide, um, but we know that's going to change. And here it's easy to predict which way is going to change. Right, um, That reaction clearly is going to move forward because there isn't any product at all right now. So that means I'm going to lose some uh, N2 and O2, and I'm going to gain twice that much NO, thank you, stoichiometry. So that gives me some equilibrium calculations or equilibrium concentrations uh, that I'm going to pop right into my KEQ expression. Right, KEQ uh, products to their stoichiometric coefficients over reactants to theirs, right? And that equals uh, the number I was given. Uh, that looks like an ugly quadratic, but actually it works out because if I just take the square root of both sides, I can get rid of all the quadratics, right? Uh, simply solve for x of 0. Uh, 0.027, but of course we want to make sure we answer the right question because standardized test, uh, they ask not for x, but for the concentration of NO, which we know is twice x. So that means the concentration of NO is 0.054 molar. Does that hold up with our kind of estimate? Yeah, it does. We didn't expect it to be very large because the KEQ is very small. Few, few products, lots of reactants left over, just like we thought. Um, so I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about something called the reaction quotient, which is often confused with KEQ. Right? Because honestly, it looks a heck of a lot the same. Right? The reaction quotient um, for this reaction, let's say, um, uh, phosphorus pentachloride goes to phosphorus trichloride plus chlorine. Um, I assemble in exactly the same way I assemble a KEQ. Right? It's just products to their stoichiometric coefficients over reactants to their stoichiometric coefficients. Well, what's the difference between that Q and a KEQ? Well, uh, the Q. I can calculate any time, right? I don't have to be at equilibrium to calculate the reaction quotient. It exists at, at any point in time. I just pop those numbers in. KEQ is something I look up in a book, right? I can change KEQ by changing temperature, but really it, it, it's a constant, right? So let's think about another way to think about uh, kind of how systems get to equilibrium is thinking about Q and KEQ, right? So let's say the Q that we calculate is less than our KEQ. Well, what would that mean? Uh, KEQ is products over reactants, and if, and if Q is less than that, that must mean there aren't enough products. So the reaction would shift forward, right? One way to think about that last problem we just did, that their initial Q was zero because there were no products, right? That was less than KEQ, so we knew the reaction shifted to the right, went forward to find its equilibrium, right? If Q is greater than KEQ, well, that would mean that I'm starting with too many products, and to find equilibrium in the reaction, we have to shift back to the left. Right, so let's, uh, let's do a quick little problem using that information. Here I have some sort of a little reaction vessel, cylindrical just for flavor, um, and I've got some initial concentrations of those three species. Is this system at equilibrium? If not, which way will it turn? Well, now you know what to do. I just write down my Q, I pop in those numbers, and I calculate what the current reaction quotient is. I compare that to the equilibrium constant. In this case, it's a little less. So that means uh, that the reaction will actually form more uh, PCL3 to form more product, right? So reaction quotient versus KQ. How do systems find equilibrium? Well, but what if they're already at equilibrium, right? We can still disturb them and watch them change. And that's where Le Chatelier's principle comes in, right? Le Chatelier's principle just says for a system at equilibrium, when it's exposed to a stress, it will shift in a way to relieve that stress. So what do I mean by stress? Not like, you know, upcoming APs. Um, but when I, when I change something in the system away from equilibrium, and there are a couple ways I could do that. I could change some concentrations, right? In the last example, I could just immediately like inject some more chlorine or something. Um, I could change the temperature. That might change things. Or I could change the pressure or volume. Right, so let's think about how those changes affect a system. And let's use that PCL5 goes to PCL3 plus CL2 example that I, I have given you. 
Um, so let's imagine, uh, or so let's think about what happens when I change concentrations, right? So um, when exposed to a stress, that is, um, I change a concentration. Well, the system is going to react to relieve that concentration change. If I increase the concentration, well, then the reaction will shift to kind of consume that thing. If I decrease a concentration, the reaction will shift to make it again and try to restore it to what an original concentration is. So in this reaction, if I were to increase chlorine, well, that would increase one of the products, right? Well, that would now mean too many products, so the reaction would shift back to the left, right? I could get that same effect by decreasing the amount of PCL5, right? Then there'd be too few reactants, and the reaction would shift back to the left. What about temperature? Um, increasing temperature favors the endothermic reactions, but uh, disfavors exothermic ones. Sure, you can memorize that, but I prefer you understand it, right? Um, well, first of all, endothermic, exothermic, I guess I need delta H. Okay, delta H, positive endothermic reactions. Um, and, but the way I'd probably prefer you think about that is, is, well, that's just heat, right? If it's an endothermic reaction, is heat a reactant or a product? Well, it's a reactant. Well, we'll just think about it like that. So now what happens if I increase temperature? It's kind of like adding a reactant, right? And we know that if we increase a reactant concentration or increase the amount of heat as a reactant, we'll shift it to the right. So just add heat to the left or right where it belongs and proceed just like you did for concentration changes, right? Finally, pressure and volume, right? Um, so increasing pressure or decreasing volume favors the side with fewer gas phase molecules. And this kind of makes sense if you think about it, right? I'm going to anthropomorphize the molecules for a hot second, forgive me. Um, you know, these guys want their space to move around. If all of a sudden I increase the pressure and jam them closer together or decrease the volume and jam them closer together, they'd probably prefer to occupy a state where there's fewer molecules rather than more. Right? So as I increase volume or, de or increase pressure or decrease volume, you'll favor the side with fewer molecules. Right? So here, if I increase the pressure, right, if I imagine my cylindrical vessel that's now like a piston and I push down on the thing, um, well, if I look at my reaction, I've got one gas phase molecule on the, on the left and two on the right. So as the volume goes down and the pressure goes up and there's less room for these guys to move, um, that side with only one molecule rather than two will be favored. So this will shift back to the left. All right, um, good, good, good. Um, and that actually kind of uh, takes us home for the day. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's about that time. Um, so I, I do wanna reiterate, um, next week, all about the problem solving. So uh, for those who joined a little late and there were a few of you, I'll, I'll make my plea one more time. Um, I am Aaron at prepmatters.com. You can send me an email if there are certain types of problems you would like me to hit a little extra hard next week because you're still a little unsteady on them. Just give me a holler. We'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, I will uh, do my best uh, to predict what I think the AP might have in store for you, which is coming up, gosh, not this coming Thursday, but next Thursday. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all on Monday for one final hurrah so that we can turn you loose to rock this test. Have a great week.